Well, thank you so much for taking out the time to talk to me. We it's really nice to have you. Uh, absolutely, Minaj, it's a pleasure. Um, we were since COVID-19 has set in, the ads on YouTube for um, brokerages um, and other um, investment bankers and different things has literally made it impossible to watch a YouTube video with peace of <laughs> mind. And <laughs> everyone wants to um, invest. Everyone wants to know how it works. Um, I don't know. It's about the regulations that have eased or it's just the people's tendency to think more of investing opportunities at the reality once they're sitting at home. Um, so before we actually uh, get into uh, mechanics of how quantum investing works. Let's talk a little bit about basic investing works. Let's tell us sure. a little bit about what's long, what's short, and all these dreary terms. Yeah, yeah. well, I'll, I'll start at a high level for what the average investor probably should do. And I, I need to uh, mention that you know, nothing that I say is is meant as investment advice. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell any security. All the views are my own, not of any firm or organization that I'm a part of. Um, so, you know, if, if one is an average investor and you're wondering, hey, what should I do with my money, right? I, my advice is exactly the same as every other person in the field, which is buy a index ETF, broad-based, and, you know, hold until you retire, right? Don't trade in and out. Don't um, uh, try to find some winning stock somewhere. It's not that it is impossible to do so, but just know that you know you're you're trading against many other folks. You're trading against other retail investors. You're trading against other institutions. Um, you you might figure out something that other people haven't, and that has indeed happened. Um, but on average, uh, your empirically retail investors happen to lose. Right? That is just on average what has has been the case historically. Um, so, so the the best way to deal with that is just to buy uh, an index fund, an index ETF, and uh, sit on it until retirement. And many investors have done that. Many retail investors have moved uh, towards that model uh, from the the seventies to today. It's only very recently, with um, COVID nineteen, uh, people sitting at home, people wanting to sort of do something with their time, so to speak. Um, that there's been a lot more uh, uh, trading, um, uh, a, a lot more retail trading, that is. Um, but even then, it's still something like 20% of the market. I, it, it, it's not as if it's uh, become a dominant force in the market. Um, now, that out of the way, um, you know, when, when you hear about, let's say, long short investing, and, and I, I think we can. Uh, Kind of go through each term that 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 kind of uh, uh, you, you're you're curious about it or you want to discuss. Um, so so when we think about long investing, that's just buying uh, securities, right? So that's just stuff that we're very used to. So long only investing, you're just buying. Um, if if you're let's say short only fund, which are relatively rare, um, what you would do is uh, you would only be shorting stocks. And what is shorting? That's where you borrow the shares from someone. You sell them, and then you hopefully you're hoping that the stock price falls so that you can buy it back at a lower price and then give the shares back to the person that lent it to you. Um, now, why would someone lend you the shares? Well, they would earn a little bit of an interest rate on, on it. So they would earn some money. Uh, you would pay them some money, that is, for, for borrowing those shares. Um, when you give the shares uh, uh, back, um, you're, you're hoping to have have done so at a lower price, bought it back at a lower price, and made made a profit there. Um, and then there's also long short investing, right? So th that's where you're going long and you're going short. You're basically trying to hedge out your bets, and and you think that one stock will outperform another. You don't necessarily have a view on the direction of the stocks in general. You just have a view that you know, let's say Ford will outperform GM. So you you go. Uh, long Ford, you short GM, and and you hope that Ford goes up relative to GM. You don't necessarily care whether they go up, they, they both go up or they both go down. You just care that Ford outperforms GM. So so that's long short investing. What I find really interesting in um, the context of 
um, day trading that 90% of people who invest in day trading actually lose their money. And these are facts. Um, sure. There's no bypassing that. Um, still, the number of signups, you look at um, the brokerages. Um, and a part of it, I believe, it comes from the fact that you have the access to these tools on your cell phone. So you can install Fidelity, you can install Interactive Broker, you can install Binance and start doing that. Um, and this overconfidence in uh, the ability to understand the markets um, and to be able to make out um, like everyone else does, uh, probably the kind of snake oil merchandise that we talk about. Uh, so tell me, where, where is this optimi uh, optim uh, you know, this optimistic view of being able to earn money without any experience coming from? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a psychological aspect to this where uh, everyone assumes that they're above average, right? So, you know, for the, you know, every individual who's going in trading, they think, look, on average, I expect to earn excess returns, right? They're, they're, they they have the same mindset as someone buying a lottery ticket and imagining their their probability of of winning being higher than it actually is, right? I mean the 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 view of you know having that sort of vacation beach home um, in in one's mind, right? That that can can cause people to do uh, uh, some irrational things and and to dream sort of. B bigger than than reality um, uh, suggests that that one empirically should, right? So, uh, where precisely the optimistic bias comes from? I, I think that's something that is better directed at a psychologist. But um, it's clear that the average investor does have that issue, right? And and you know, interestingly, I don't think that that's unique to um, retail investors. I suspect that's true of institutional investors. I suspect that's true of fund managers. Um, you know, interestingly, 90% of fund managers in large cap US space, they underperform over any 10 year period. That only makes sense. Well, I mean, it could make sense in one of one of two uh, contexts. One is they're just hoodwinking people, right? They're, they, they know they're going to underperform but they just try to convince their clients that, hey, look, I'm, I'm going to outperform. Um, I'm, I'm not that cynical. I'm sure some people are like that, but I'm not quite that cynical. I think they genuinely believe they're good and, and they're going to, um, to win on average. And that's in general why, you know, I, I like to choose areas where the institutional investors and mutual fund managers, so on and so forth, are on average winning. Right. If you find a, a country like that, a market like that, then um, you should feel reasonably confident. Right. The, then instead of needing to be the 95th percentile to earn excess returns, you could even theoretically be the 50th percentile to earn excess returns. And then every improvement you make on that is more excess returns. Um, so, you know, I, I think that should be the game. Right. If 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 one wants to uh, find a, a a place where where you can earn excess returns, find a place where other people are earning them, and and you know other people like you that is, um, and and th those are the markets that are are safest to play in. because it, it's better to just assume you're average. Right. That's that's the 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 good assumption when you're looking at the market. It's, it's an adversarial game. You know, with no prior information, you know, I'm I'm a, a draw from the average uh, uh, dis average of the distribution. I think throughout the history of um, stocks and investing, we've noticed there are only two methods to be able to find out if the company is as good as it says. Um, one is the technical analysis of how it's going. You know, checking the paper rates. You know, applying different. Um, tools to that, um, RSI, moving averages, billing your bands, sure. and things like that. Um, and then we have fundamental analysis, which is the good old wise way of, you know, is this guy has, um, has he ever done uh, what he has um, ever said? Um, and where he's come from, who he is, who he knows, you know, how long has he been in the business, is he reliable, and things like that. And when we talk about quant analysis, um, it's somewhere in the between, or let's say it's a new kid on the block. Now, yeah. um, it has also proved itself to be a formidable um, force to um, reckon with. And now that it's out there, it's not only staying with 
institutional investors. It's boiling over to real investors also. A lot of people who, who have some skill or some mathematical understanding, you know, they're getting into algorithms um, sure. and trying to automate their investing process. Tell us how quant investing um, is different from all previous investing um, ideas and what, what is the edge that it has over others? Yeah, so so quant investing encompasses a wide variety of things. One uh, on the kind of simplest side is things like sm what, what's called smart beta. So that's where you get a particular factor exposure. And what that sort of means is you're sorting various stocks on characteristics. And some of those are fundamental, like book to market, um, like return on equity. Some might be technical, like momentum. And you buy the stocks with high values of those things and, and you avoid stocks with, with low values of those things. So that's on the simpler side. Um, interestingly, you know, if you look at the live results of smart beta funds, and there've been a couple of papers on this, um, they haven't been very good, right? So, so that side of quant investing, um, you know, I, I think there's still something there, but it's very simple. Right, and and you would want to do that if you you wanted uh, a strategy that's just easy to understand, and you you expect on average or an excess returns. Now, um, as you get more complex, um, there are certainly you know empirically you you can see like oh these folks seem to be winning, right? So if you get into the high frequency trading market making side of quant investing, which is on the other extreme, right? So that's where it's just pure algorithmic uh, uh, trading. Um, and it's, you know, just technical signals working on a few seconds, um, maybe a few minutes um, down to a tick by tick, right? So, so each uh, a single tick of, of a stock or a security. Um, that, uh, you know, that makes money, right? So, so you know, they, these are liquidity providers are also, um, predicting markets at a love at a uh, frequency that they are indeed predictable and there's a lot of trading coming from outside of that space that is uninformed at that level right it, it's you, you know the the trades that are coming from a retail investor or even from the average institution is not trying to predict stock prices over the next few seconds or minutes and that means that the the high frequency traders can kind of take advantage of those trades on that horizon. Um, so, so that side, you know, they make money um, on average. Then there's the in-between, right? And, and the in-between is where I live. So, so that's where you're using machine learning algorithms. Um, well, if, if you consider, uh, you know, it, it, it depends on, on what you, you consider machine learning, but, you know, uh, uh, linear ridge, gradient boosting, random forest, um, predicting returns on a monthly horizon, uh, using a mix of fundamental signals and technical signals, um, and using optimization to, to build portfolios out of that. So the question is, look, empirically, is that successful or not? And the answer is we don't know. It's, it's very difficult to like disentangle um, all, the, all the funds out there and say, oh, these are the guys doing kind of just factor-based stuff, the, the things that look like smart beta. These are the funds that are doing um, the more machine learning optimization stuff, right? But, but at least what we have seen, bo you know, both in our portfolios and in our back tests, is that the machine learning optimization approach appears to beat out the smart beta approach and appears to beat out the cat-weighted approach, at least in the markets where th that we would consider inefficient, right? So, so if I just executed this in U.S. large, um, I, I wouldn't make very much money. U.S. large cap, that is, right? So these are highly liquid uh, stocks, well uh, uh, covered. Um, if I executed this in China A shares, right? So, so mainland Chinese stocks, um, I would earn, you know, at least historically, quite a bit of money. Um, so, so, you know, uh, if, if you want to think in information ratios, uh, we can generate walk forward back tests. I'll, I, I can talk about that later, uh, if you'd like, uh, that generate information ratios of three. 
and then in, in EM, about two, and in US, something like 0.6, right? And, and then once you start eating away transaction costs and assume the market gets more efficient over time, it's probably even lower than that. Um, so that's where, that, that's the sort of quant investing um, that I do, right? The, the machine learning base, yes, but feature engineering is really important. It's based on fundamentals. Uh, primarily, there are definitely technical signals in there as well. It's very interesting that you just talked about feature engineering, and that's probably where it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, when we use quant strategies, um, we have a lot of features to consider. So we've got seasonality, we've got pairs, we've got mean universal trend based. Um, we also have dollar neutral um, pairs. And um, one of the problems, which is probably the huge problem, is the stock markets are more often than not decided by rumors and news. And that is something that, you know, to quantify that you have to, ha you know, have a really good accuracy on sentiment analysis. Uh, and human language is not as straightforward as um, people think it would. Um, so the accuracy that it's going to give you doesn't actually always translate into signals that are useful. So talk mm -hmm. a little bit about before we actually go in deep into the machine learning and neural networks, talk to us a little bit about are there any methods to make sure that all these um, strategies uh, will be able to give us signals that can be used um, in the market to um, gain an alpha that beats the market? So it, it depends on your prediction horizon. If you're predicting on a very short basis, right? So, you know, you're in the high frequency space. You don't need to think about fundamentals, right? That, that's like sort of irrelevant to, to the game. If you're predicting at a one month or longer horizon, um, you should, you know, when you're doing feature engineering, you should always think, how does this feed in to the value of the firm? Right? So the, the you, you, we've actually sort of developed a, a theory, uh, uh, here, um, where we are predicting uh, return on, well, it's technically return on net operating assets, but but let's say return on equity. It it's, um, gets at the same idea. So uh, we, we predict return on equity. Um, and if a signal predicts return on equity after controlling for some straightforward variables like historical return on equity, like book to market ratio, like the market capitalization of the firm. If adding um, that variable is able to, to help prediction of return on equity, then that seems like a good signal. And you wanna be kind of overweighting it in the direction of its prediction of return on equity. Now you might say, well, why is that, right? So, so why do we kind of go back to this fundamental um, uh, part of, of the market um, or, or, or of companies, right? It's not even about the market. It's about, you know, the, the fundamentals of firms. Um, it's because, you know, like you said, uh, markets are noisy, right? So, so you know, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, prices will move one way or the other. And, and so when you build your quant algorithm that's predicting on a uh, monthly basis, you don't expect to get every stock right all of the time. Um, even in, in your back test, right? Um, and, and, and so what, what you see is, you know, out of sample R squares of just a few percent. Now in that space, if, if that's, you know, your, your extent of predicting returns, you want to anchor to something fundamental because you don't want your model to be misled. And, and the, the, the thing to anchor to is the value of the firm. The value of the firm is equal to its discounted future cash flows. Let me try to predict its future cash flows or earnings in, in our, our model that we're using. Um, and, and that will help us choose which features to include. Interestingly, um, we can add a feature because all, all of our prediction, which, you know, I, I'm I'm sure everyone already does this, right? And, and everyone who's implementing ML. Um, because we're predicting out of sample, it could be the case that we add a feature that predicts earnings, right? Um, that then doesn't predict return well enough and actually reduces our backtested return. That's fine. That's our new backtest. Our backtest is a little bit worse now than it was before. 
if you don't take that approach and you're only including things that improve your back test of return, then you're going to have a data snoop back test. Then you're going to have a back test that becomes unmoored from the underlying economics. Um, and you can run into a problem where you are heavily overfit, works well in a back test, you run it in the live portfolio, it doesn't work that well. Um, we're going to be getting back to back testing a little bit more, but right now I want you to tell us a little bit about inherent biases that people have. So one of those, um, you talked a little bit about that, uh, Murray, survivorship bias, um, the kind of data that um, we wish um, we would have used, but we actually hadn't. And that was actually a useful one. Expand a little bit upon uh, what that is. Oh, so, you know, you can have survivorship bias in your data itself, where, for example, if you had only firms that um, survived, you know, you're, you only have firms that currently exist in 2021, and you run your back test on firms that only exist in 2021. Well, that includes, that excludes, I'm sorry, a lot of firms that went bankrupt, right? So you wouldn't have pets.com, you wouldn't have WorldCom, you wouldn't have Enron. And so there are a lot of things that you would bet on in your uh, back test. Just that, to interrupt you, uh, are, right. isn't that data um, available through um, SEC um, for analysis or is it totally taken off? No, no, no. It's you can definitely get their uh, Edgar filings. Or I'm, I'm sorry, their I, I should I should be I shouldn't use uh, language like that. It's it's uh, too obscure. So so you, you can get their annual reports and and so on um, through the SEC. Um, but you know, it, many websites won't have stock returns for all stocks. So I you know if you were like using, let's say, Yahoo Finance or something like that to, to pull returns, uh, you would run into um, survivorship uh, bias issues. Now, if, if you use, you know, WorldScope Datastream or Chris CompuStat, uh, you would be okay there, right? You, you, you know, I mean, they, they, they don't have survivorship uh, bias in their uh, uh, stock returns. So um, at, at least, you know, in, in the, certainly the past 20 uh, to 30 year sample. Um, so it, you know, you, you definitely want to run a back test there, but, but there's another type of, um, survivorship bias that I, I think you, you may be getting at, which is where we only see the people who have done well, right? So, so yes, it's true. If you go on wall street bet, some people will post really large losses, right? And be like, wow, look how much money I lost. Um, but often they're posting huge gains. And, you know, in general, when you, you hear about the great fund managers, you hear about the ones that have done, uh, uh, you know, you hear about the ones that have done very well. Occasionally you hear about ones that have blown up, but you rarely hear about the guys who just kind of dribbled down into nothing, right? Um, so you end up viewing the world in, in a way that, wow, you know, I, I can do it. You know, the, this guy uh, bought out of the money call options on GameStop in September 2019 and became a multimillionaire. Um, that's uh, something that not, you know, not everyone can do, right? Not everyone can either be that lucky or that prescient. Um, so that's where a lot of um, like psychological bias comes in. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure which survivorship bias you were, you were referring to there. I, oh, guess I was talking to, to later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, what's really fascinating for me is the fact that um, how we can leverage the power of uh, machine learning and, and neural networks to be able to, you know, feed all this data from different streams um, into an algorithm. And it tells us um, the basic one. But one of the methodological issues that I can think of, um, and has been reported by a lot of users, um, is how much weight should it should you give to a certain information um, relative to the other one? For example, we just talked about seasonality and pairs um, sure. and trend versus reversal base. Um, and in the end, it is um, upon the fund manager to decide uh, which he should prioritize or let go. Um, and that also uh, comes um, at a cost of um, what algorithms can achieve. Um, I've recently been uh, looking at the and Contopia uh, open source tool uh, designed in Python, um, which gives uh, some of the quantitative tools to retail investors. Um, and 
what they don't tell people is that in the end, there always is a need for a fund manager. So how much automation can we actually get out of this uh, whole investing uh, process? Um, I'm going to be talking a little about um, Ernie Chen also, but let's you know, get your um, view on this one also. Yeah, you know, I, I think there's more automation possible than, um, than was suggested there, so to speak. So, um, you know, at, at the extreme, if you're on the high frequency side, you know, there's no person executing anything. It's, it's all done algorithmically. The, the data is coming in, you're... Uh, per, you know the the predictions of, of returns are, are happening on the fly and and trades are are being executed um, even on the the monthly horizon yes it's absolutely true that there are humans um, you know doing careful feature engineering um, but you know what, once you get the expected returns I mean you certainly examine them to make sure that everything is okay but you uh, you know, you, you you execute on the optimized portfolios. As far as the, you know, when you are dealing with different strategies, and I think that's what you're getting at. Hey, you have this pairs trading strategy, you have this trend following strategy. Um, so that's not how I implement personally. So I have expected returns for underlying security. So to aggregate them is actually fairly straightforward, right? It's just a, an optimization. Um, if you have multiple strategies, um, one way to deal with that is to generate expected returns for the strategies and then uh, do the optimization on that level. But without generating expected returns and a covariance matrix or other forms of risk, the act of aggregating in, indeed does become a human act. Um, and in general, it, it's not that you want to avoid that. It, you know, humans are irrational, but we're not. Uh, you know, when it comes to like aggregating strategies, we equally weight a bunch of strategies. I, I think you're probably okay if they all have uh, positive uh, expected return or, or figuring out some sort of heuristic sharp ratio weighting. Um, but, you know, I, uh, if you have a large enough cross section, it is better to take the expected return approach in my estimation. Um, it's and also because, kind of assumes right. the fact that uh, markets are going to be the bull markets and they're going to perform as they have already um, have in near history or let's say long-term history. I mean, we don't actually take in the amount of variance that can actually happen in a market from the um, disruptions that are totally unforeseeable. Talk about COVID-19. So what do sure. you do when you calculate expected returns um, for a diverse uh, portfolio? Yeah, so so it's a good point that that there are these um, unexpected shocks that can affect them, or even expected shocks, right? It could, it could just be an expected shock that is, isn't accounted for in the model. Um, so so there are these shocks that can uh, impact the market and the prediction in a way that the model fails to capture. Now, if we're living on the high frequency trading side, these extremely volatile environments are fantastic. Right. So uh, COVID, you know, as far as high frequency trading firms were concerned, you know, COVID-19, um, the uh, 2008 uh, crash, those were high profit periods. Right. So that's when they earned a lot of money, both on when, on when the market went down and when the market went up, um, where they failed to make money or not failed to make money. When they make significantly less money is when the market is flat. Right. And, and it's not really doing anything. Um, there's less very short-term um, predictability there. Um, as far as these sort of more medium-term models that uh, are actually trying to capture firm valuation, yes, that you know when when a shock happens, they will miss information. Um, but some of the technical signals end up manifesting uh, this information. Right, so so and and eventually the the fundamentals will also manifest the, the information, but that, but that's obviously farther down the road. Um, so you know, one and right, so 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 one signal that you could use is investor flows, right? So so you you can rely on other smart money flows. So in in China that would be uh, foreign institutional flows or um, 
just just foreign flows in general, northbound connect flows, or the the larger institutional flows within China. So all of those are considered smart money flows, um, and that's where you can capture uh, information that may be predictable, but the average you know model just relying on pure fundamentals would fail to predict. Um, so, so relying on smart money means relying on other folks insight, right? And another thing you can do is use analyst forecast, right? The, these are signals that are somewhat resilient to predictable shocks, right? That as, as long as there's, there is a, uh, stock that's either, you know, somewhat predictable or at the very least you know, it, it happens and it takes a while to, to fully manifest in the market. You can, you can rely on other smart people to, to kind of uh, uh, piggyback off of their insights. Um, so, so the, you know, the, that's a way to build these sort of resilient signals, these signals that are uh, not, not fully protected against regime shifts, but far more protected than just say, looking at value or profitability. Someone like you who has a very really strong grasp on the market and has been there for decades. Um, I was just wondering what's your take on um, some of seasoned investors uh, view about tech stock. But, uh, Buffett said that he's not going to touch tech stock with a 10 feet pole. And I'm just wondering what are the more reliable industries that people can count on uh, if they're investing their money? Well, I, I mean, you know, if I were, uh, so, so I, I wouldn't pick industries as a um, kind of retail investor, right? I, I would just buy the, the the ETF that includes tech stocks and everything else as well, right? I wouldn't I wouldn't explicitly bet on or against. So, for example, um, I mean, let, right. let's assume that you know you have the free will and um, you think of yourself as someone smart, and you know you had the option. Uh, and now, I'm, mm -hmm. I mean, you're in a position right now that you know even if you were to doing uh, retail investing, you would probably make smarter choices. Um, so personally, the, the, some stocks are probably more reliable than others. Tech mm -hmm. stocks, you know, it can either be a hit or a miss. So what's your take? I mean, are you more towards FMCG? Um, well, or well, Yeah, I, I, so, so, so it's an, an interesting question, right? The, 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 because I, I think you're raising something uh, powerful, I would say. And, and I think it's, it's worthwhile to understand. So... I, I'm a quant investor, right? I've been in the industry for 15 years. One would assume I'd be better at picking stocks than the average person that you pull off the street. I don't think that's true, right? I, I suspect if you put me head to head and, and, and you know, I, I didn't have any of my quant tools and I just had to read financial reports and, and say, hey, you know, I think the stock's going to go up. And, and I just had to compete with someone, just so, someone off the street. I don't think I'd do any better. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a quant investor. I just don't, I, I, you know, I, I know how to predict returns in aggregate. If somebody said, pick a stock, I would say, I'll pick the broadest base ETF and hold on to that, but I'm not going to pick a stock. Um, so, you, you know, it, it, it's not, how, how would I say this? So I, I think somebody once asked, uh, Daniel Kahneman, right. Who's, um, a, a behavioral, um, He's, he's not a behavioral economist. I'm sorry. He's a psychologist, right? But, but, but he's, he's been extremely influential on uh, behavioral economics. Um, somebody asked him, uh, so, you know, you know so much about um, psychological biases. Um, so, so you must be much more rational and, and able to kind of see through your own biases. And he said, no, I you know, that's the nature of biases, right? I, I, I understand that it is, it is a thing. I, I, I understand, I'm able to uh, notice that these biases exist, but I, I can't fight them, right? In a similar way, you know, I'm, I'm able to capture these excess returns based on the irrational behaviors of investors. But if I went in being a retail investor, I would be an irrational retail investor, right? It, I would be making those same mistakes. My algorithm would probably be trading against me. 
Um, I was just wondering, isn't Daniel Kahneman the one who got Nobel Prize for his behavioral economics? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, I remember actually reading uh, some of his work. It's very interesting, you know, the, people kind of downplay the importance of uh, behavioral economics um, and people think that it's just uh, sheer numbers, but it's not that. Um, let's talk a little bit about your uh, life in COVID-19. Uh, how does a normal day for a uh, coin investor looks like? Um, Stanford published a Stanford uh, article on Zoom fatigue. Uh, do you also have this um, tick fatigue? We know when you look at the screen for a longer yeah. time. Yeah, th that's a so so certainly tech fatigue. So I, my I've had eye strain issues when looking at a screen for like twelve hours, and I've I've gotten better about it. I've been using you know uh, I had well lit backgrounds at nighttime. I I go into dark mode, all that other stuff. Um, so you know I I've been mitigating the eye eye strain there. Um, but, uh, you know, in general, as a quant, you're not having a lot of meetings, you're doing a lot of research. So you're sitting in front of your computer a lot. You do, and, and this is true, even pre COVID-19, um, interestingly, I think our productivity as a group has gone up since, uh, we've been quarantined. Right. And, and so, you know, but before we would all come into a single area and, and work, but it's very easy to get distracted, right? I mean, you, you're just, you know, you're, you're trying to, right. I mean, you know, you're, you're trying to code up some algorithm, whatever it is, right? Um, and and you just hear like the clicking of keys and you're like, God, I can't, you know, I, I just can't get to where I need to mentally, right? Um, whereas now, you know, you can work in pure silence. Um, and and I, I think uh, the group's productivity has has gone up quite a bit. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think it, it's an accidental experiment, but it's, it's been a really cool and, um, productive one in, in, in that sense. Right. So, you, you know, pr practically on, on a day-to-day -day basis, regardless of, um, uh, one's, uh, you know, pre COVID or not the, the, the day of a, of quant looks something like, you know, you, you have your, your stand-up meeting, um, the, though we actually have it at the end of the day because we have folks in China, but th th that's neither here nor there, right? So, so you know, you have your stand-up meeting uh, at the, at the beginning of the day. Um, you discuss um, what you're going to do that day, what obstacles you have, so on and so forth. If anything, if you, if you need something from anyone, you just say, "Hey, hey, look, I'm going to need X, Y, Z. Um, can can you make sure to do it?" Um, we, you know, all all the researchers go through that. Um, we can do a variety of things, right? So if we're doing uh, signal research, feature engineering, um, we'll be uh, maybe pulling data, cleaning the data, examining the data, seeing if the economic, if, if the data is economically intuitive, um, and, and then trying to trying to build the, the right feature out of that, that uh, data. Um, if we're predicting returns and, and trying to kind of improve the model, uh, we might be doing some uh, hyperparameter tuning. Well, I mean, you, it, that's the same as as any other machine learning project, right? So, so you're kind of uh, testing different models, adjusting hyperparameters, so on and so forth. Um, Do you think um, four week, uh, four day week, or six hour um, week is going to work uh, on Wall Street also? Because the research is very clear that you know it increases your productivity. Yeah, yeah. I well, um. It's it's not abundantly clear, but but it, there's definitely evidence. Well, in Scandinavia, it. it's been yeah. experimented. Yeah, yeah, but but I mean, the the the, the question is like, ha, has it sort of worked in in every run or or an aggregate? I actually I don't know, but I I do agree that the idea is conceptually enticing for a simple reason: you cannot do extremely difficult things for 12 hours straight. If you're working 12, and it is absolutely true, I've had 12 hour days. After hour six, I am getting very little done, right? Um, well, maybe not six, but at, at least after hour eight, right? I'm, I'm pretty drained. Um, and, and, you know, that's where bugs get introduced. That's where, um, you know, you're, you're sitting at, at the screen, looking at that cursor sitting there and, and not really uh, uh, making any, any progress. Um, so, you know, in, in cognitively demanding tasks, 
um, especially tasks that are just nonstop cognitively demanding. So, so you know, quant research is just, you know, the, there are rarely times where you're doing something rote. Um, yeah, I, I could see it. I could totally see I mean, a world uh, where it's six have, hour days. We have this assumption that in Silicon Valley that, you know, it wouldn't work if people are not uh, under one roof and uh, nine to five. Uh, but certainly since we uh, went to quarantine, people started working from home and productivity actually increased. So mm -hmm. it's probably it's more of a uh, mental schema that we have, we have developed that, you know, people have to be in office from nine to five working in hours um, mm -hmm. is probably the... Um, upright thing to do but maybe it's not um and let's talk this uprightness uh, back to uh, one of the dichotomies that has uh, bugged a lot of people uh um, elizabeth warren is outspoken um critic of um corporate um america um then we have uh, a plan of uh, introducing taxes um, for businesses and that's a lifelong dichotomy between retail um, and institutional um, investors and i was just wondering why is that um, that an investment that should technically be open to everyone does not give retail investors the same platform and that it does to institutional investment? Right. Oh, oh, well, I, I, th I think you're, you're talking about it two different things there, right? One is about um, introducing taxes into uh, the... Uh, basically increasing tax on, on rich people and, and so on and so forth. And certainly getting rid of the tax breaks for- Yeah, but the reason um, I'm asking is that right. uh, not, not the tax increase itself, but tax yeah. increase because they believe that these companies are not treating um, people fairly. Because if they were peeping, yeah. treating them fairly, there would be no issue of increasing taxes or, you know- uh, Well, I, I, I would actually disagree there. So, so the, the reason why you want wealth redistribution is due to the marginal utility of consumption. So, so the, the, that's a, um, oh, well, I, I think it's worthwhile to explain this, right? So um, if you have uh, whatever, your, your income's $10,000 a year, right? So, so increasing your income to $20,000 a year uh, has a significant benefit. If you're making a million dollars a year, increasing it to uh, a, uh, you know, a, a million, $10,000 um, is not going to have that much benefit, right? So, so that's uh, the rationale behind wealth redistribution, right? It, it's not about, I, I mean, I think they pose it in terms of fairness. And, and indeed, you know, that, that's how politicians always talk about, it, right? Paying your so fair What do you share, think about universal basic income then? Uh, it is likely a good idea given the evidence that I've seen on it. Um, but I don't, you know, I, I, I'm not willing to just come out and say, yes, universal basic income, let's definitely do it. I, I think we can, God, I mean, the, the only way to run an empirical test is to do it in aggregate. Um, but, you know, we, we could pass it for a year, fund it with um, value added tax, right? This is Andrew Yang's, um, Andrew Yang, I'm sorry, Andrew Yang's idea. Um, they already and, did that in Finland, by the way. Um, some people think it was a success, some other people think it isn't. And you know, I'm really interesting, uh, interested in exploring more um, how it can actually benefit. Because in a society like Scandinavia, you know, everyone is pretty much cared for um, healthcare and education mm -hmm. and everything else. In more capitalistic societies um, like US itself, uh, how would that actually play out? Is it going to boost the innovation or is it going to increase the uh, freeloading um, tendencies of people? What right. do you think? Well, the, the, the most freeloading occurs where you have a benefit only if you don't work, right? So, or, you know, th that's where you will get actual freeloading. If you are getting money no matter what, it doesn't actually generate freeloading, it, you know, unless someone's very happy with twelve thousand um, dollars a year, which some people might be. Um, but but on average, people would just say, "Look, I I'm going to work a little bit more on top of that, right?" Um, and I, I mean, not not even a little bit more. I mean, people would just probably work roughly as much. Um, but we'll see, right? Um, and also, it would replace a lot of the other. Uh, programs that rely on people not working or not having as high of an income. So if you have, um, 
you, you know, if you have disability payments, but if and only if you don't um, work um, or you can't work, then that creates a disincentive to work, right? And and so the the better way to do that is just to provide the money anyway, and you know, hey, you can you can go back to work if 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 you'd like as well. Um, so so you know th that's the benefit of UBI, right? That that it doesn't actually create a disincentive to to work, and and so it could uh, replace programs that kind of structurally have freeloading built in. Um, Right. I, I mean, I, yeah. I think that's the ultimate game. Yeah, I think that probably would invo invoke a lot of uh, McCarthyism in um, U.S. Uh, certainly in debates. But let's move on to another interesting topic. About well, I, well, you know, McCarthyism was rooting out communists, right? I mean, that's the, the, this is. Well, it doesn't very take very long. It it doesn't take very long to connect um, UBI to socialism and again then to communism. I mean, oh, uh, people can well, always I mean, blow things out of proportion, right? right? Uh. So, so UBI is a tough one, right? Because it's been advocated by some, uh, I don't want to call them right-wing economists, but, but certainly very capitalist uh, uh, economists have, have been saying, look, let's just replace all of this, uh, all of these kind of welfare programs and stuff with UBI. Um, that, you know, it, it won't create a disincentive to work and it will provide people at, at the bottom, a pretty strong safety net. Um, so, you, you know, being, uh, you, you know, capitalism and UBI, there, there's no, um, you, you know, the, the, those things are perfectly compatible with each other. Um, why, they're, hasn't, they're, they could, why hasn't sorry? it been applied so far in the history of capitalist economies? Um, well, it's, it hasn't been applied very many places, period, right? I, I mean, you know, it's why been applied not? in a in Alaska, well, well, I, I, I mean, you know, it, it, it requires uh, accumulating sufficient funds at, at the government level to. to oh, you can always argue, yeah, you don't have enough funds. Um, yeah, yeah, but, but, you know, the, that's where the sort of redistribution comes into play, right? You have to get the money from, from somewhere. And hence we have McCarthyism also, because you know, then people would, you know, say people don't want to actually help poor right. people. Give but, them but I, I mean. But, 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 you know, we, we ought to keep in mind, McCarthyism was because of geopolitical, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not saying McCarthyism was a, was a good thing. I'm just saying, think about the environment there, right? That there is a, uh, a military power that, you know, a large military power that your adversary is with. And, you know, these folks out of um, either delusion or, uh, uh, you know, some sort of malicious uh, uh, kind of... Um, desires for, for power or whatever, um, they were able to paint um, the, you know, folks within, within the, their country, within the United States as uh, uh, communists, right? So, you know, without that sort of um, uh, external geopolitical threat, right, you, you can't have a, a McCarthy you can't have McCarthyism, right? I mean, I mean, nobody's going to get that worked up about UBI in a let's kind of bring these people in, in front of, um, uh, you know, let's let's bring An Andrew Yang in front of uh, uh, Congress and and call him a traitor. Um, that is, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, th that's just not not how I I would expect a debate about UBI to play out. Um, now, now people might accuse um, these folks of being um, you know, promoting freeloading of, of um, you know, uh, basically, you know, causing slower economic growth. Um, it, you know, it is needs to be empirically tested whether that actually plays out. Um, but you know, I I don't think we need to worry about a new era of McCarthyism. That's that. Fair enough. We can agree on that. Yeah. Uh, let's okay. move on to quant investing um, for retail investors. That's been a huge buzz um, in the market for people um, who are very confident about their programming skills and their clear voyants um, mm -hmm. to be able to earn profits. Um, and Ernest Chang, huge name in quant investing, he wrote a book about quant training, um, trading. And he talks about the fact that, um, you know, it doesn't really take, I mean, you briefly talked about the fact that um, it doesn't really take, 
a PhD to be able to understand basic principles of um, trading. Does it also apply to mm-hmm. quant trading also? If you know the basics, would you be able to crack it as a regional investor? Yeah, I mean, you certainly don't need a PhD in finance. Uh, you know, it definitely, you know, if you had a PhD in computer science or, uh, you know, machine learning, um, why well, I guess I, th- I think it would be a PhD in statistics, right? With the focus on machine learning. Uh, it depends on the program, right? But, but um, you know, that would probably help more. Um, but certainly a PhD in finance, if, if you, you know, I happen to have a PhD in finance, but it doesn't help me as a quant investor. It just, it's completely orthogonal. It's, it's just a nice piece of paper. Um, so, you know, if, if, you know, if, if you're thinking of becoming a, a quant investor, that's your goal. Don't get a PhD in finance. That's for damn sure. Uh, you, you know, you, you want to, you definitely want to learn about about markets, about what predicts a market. Um, probably a, a master's in financial engineering might be appropriate. Um, I, I have one of those, um, but uh, you know, if if you worked for a firm coming in out of undergrad that was you know a, a quant firm, you could probably learn everything you'd need to know in a few years. Um, you could then go off on your own, but God, I I just you know, you need a lot of capital for it to make sense, right? Um, it, 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 you know, if you got whatever, a, a million bucks stashed away, that's probably not enough to just say, hey, look, I'm just going to focus on quant investing and make a ton of money. Like, you know, practically that that's insufficient funds to, to uh, just have that be your, your game. Um, so, you know, d- don't, if, if, if one is thinking of, doing quant investing on, on your personal funds, you know, unless you have a ton of money uh, to start with, it's not going to be your, your path to further riches. Uh, un- unless you've, maybe your algorithms are better than mine, but, but you know, the, the, it's, it's not that sort of, sort of thing. You, you need a, a good chunk of change to start with to, to, is- for, for, for the returns to be meaningful. That is. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm just wondering, what is a PhD good for then? Oh, um, if you want to go into academia, it's um, it's necessary, right? That's number one. Number two is if you're doing, um, it, this is really uh, strange to say, but um, so if you work at a firm where uh, you need to market your product, right? It's not you just managing your money. It's just good to have a PhD in, in something to be like, oh, I have a PhD. Right. I, I mean, so, so it, it's, and, and that's indeed the, the type of firm that I work at. So, so the, the act of being able to say like, oh yeah, I have a PhD, you know, that's um, worth something, but like, does it actually help me on a day-to-day basis? No, I, I, I don't think so. Um, I think we've had a long, a lot of conversations with uh, fantastic people who have PhDs on my show. And one of the themes that emerges um, time and time again is the fact that how ridiculous this piece of paper has become. Um, for example, Think of the fact that you have worked in uh, Wall Street and you know other positions, VPs, directors, CEOs. Um, they have worked their lifetime um, understanding a topic, um, having significant accomplishments. They don't have a PhD, uh, sure. even though they have done things. Uh, they 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 cannot get a PhD technically for that. And people yeah. right out of, out from undergraduate, they worked for five years, done nothing of significant importance, only wrote papers, you know, yeah, yeah, theoretical yeah. book, you know, right. they have a PhD. Yeah, Isn't yeah, it yeah. Like, right. I mean, what does it tell you about education system? Well, well I, would, I mean, I, I wouldn't, so, so just keep in mind, a PhD doesn't mean an expert on the field in general, an expert on application. What does it mean, actually? It, sure, it, 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 it's, it's referring to an expertise in a particular uh, a topic, and it might just be an academic topic that's not at all interesting to. Um, Why are we asking them to teach our children who don't know anything practical? No, no yeah, that, that's an interesting question, right? Well, why don't we separate the act of research and teaching, right? It, so, so it does make sense for PhDs to teach uh, other PhDs and even other people who are teaching, right? Because y- there are things on the cutting edge that are perfectly applicable that are coming from PhDs, right? That's true in every field, right? Um, so th- th- there, are, and, and it's more true in other fields, 
right? So if, if you're going into, um, God, um, developing pharmaceuticals. Now, I, God, I actually don't know. I, I imagine the MDs and the PhDs are uh, dominating that. I it's mean, for example, guess, um, you right. have your master's degree in financial engineering, right? Yeah. Who would you expect um, to teach you better? Um, a guy who has a PhD who has done, uh, who hasn't done a single day of work in engineering department or someone who is a VP of engineering department who is very good at finance? Well, right. I mean, it, it would be right. I mean, you know, like maybe a, a VP in a, a financial, you know, firm that does financial engineering. But but yeah, I, I, I get you there. Um, and indeed, they, they do have those folks come in and, and, and talk, right? Um, but, you know, I, I agree that those folks would teach you more practical knowledge. Uh, they're, the foundational things, practically, the professors are pretty good at that, right? Now, you know, why in particular? Um, Being professors of dyslexia. How do you assume that, you know, they can teach it better? I mean, and a graduate student can probably do a very good job uh, right after the oh, college. Oh, I mean, so graduate students often do teach, but honestly, uh, I would call that a mixed bag, right? I, I mean, you know, I, I we, we've we all, I, maybe, I, I assume we've all had graduate student, student uh, professors and they can be great and they can be uh, bad. I actually think the volatility is greater among graduate students in terms of uh, quality, the standard deviation of quality is probably greater among graduate students than among professors. Um, but, uh, you, you know, I, I do, I, well, well, let me kind of get at this, this idea that, that I do. I think what I'm trying to get is, I mean, let's talk about the solution instead. I mean, instead of, you know, sure. I'm moaning about things. I was thinking, and I think there, there's already a trend in, at least in Australia, I believe, that, you know, mm -hmm. you have something called a PhD based on your working experience. Um, and I think that would give a lot of people uh, incentive for the kind of work or the effort that they put in a lifetime career and stability. I, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't know about that. I, so the, the, the specific thing that, that PhDs are presumably good at is research in a particular field, right? And if you're not um, doing research in that field, um, and trying to push the field forward, then it doesn't, right? So certainly like a CEO, right? Like it doesn't make sense for that, for that person to have a PhD, right? That, that, that person is not doing research to push a, a given field uh, forward. So, so I, I would at the very least, you know, want to subset the, the, uh, the, the folks that got this sort of whatever honorary PhD or whatever it might be. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think solutions are actually more on the, the teaching versus um, research front, right? So the, mm -hmm. the, the act of separating teacher, you know, the, you know this person is, and, and they might have a PhD, they might not, but, you know, this person is an excellent teacher, um, you know, they're going to focus on teaching. This person is an excellent researcher, they're going to focus on research. And the, the question then is, well, how do you bridge that gap? Um, well, the the excellent researcher, you know, who's discovering these new things, you know, perhaps he can have a seminar for, for these, uh, you know, professors, perhaps he can, who, you know, who are actually teaching, perhaps um, uh, he'll be teaching these other graduate students uh, that are uh, coming up and, and they'll go on to teach uh, uh, folks how to, how, to, how to do things. So, you know, I, I know, um, you know, and plenty of uh, uh, schools do this, right? They'll, they'll have, um, uh, you know, teachers who are teaching and, and they'll also have some, some professors who, who do uh, uh, research as well. Now, I, you know, the folks who focus on teaching, they're incentivized to teach. If they're bad teachers, they'll be fired. The folks who are doing research and, and teaching, they're incentivized to do research. And, you know, that's why their teaching often suffers. The way to fix it, in my mind, is to uh, separate those tasks, right? I, I, I think that'll do it. We don't need to give PhDs to other people, right? But, let, but let's talk numbers here. Um, right. You said, you know, PhD is someone who is narrowed down on a specific topic and, you know, has expertise in that. How many students do actually need that? 
only if you're in a PhD or in, if you're in a very advanced research and degree, that's where you actually need that. Most of the people who are studying foundational courses are trying to learn the trick of the trades in undergraduates, lots of educational colleges and schools. All they need is practical knowledge. And where does it come from? It comes from people who are practically doing that and broader doing that. It's not like they're specialized in one area. So yeah, right. So I, I mean, I by, that. by that logic, we need a lot less PhDs than a lot more PhDs. Yeah, well, I, I mean, w w what you would do there is you would, um, so, 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 so let's imagine that that was a game, right? So, so how, how would we approach that, um, that model, right? So, so after um, high school, you would go to uh, apprentice somewhere and, and, you know, you, you, you would have this sort of apprenticeship approach where, where you don't necessarily um, need to go to school. Um, but th that being said, there, there's some foundational knowledge that ends up being useful. So, for example, even though I don't, um, you know, if, if somebody came came to me and it was like, "Hey, can you teach me uh, linear algebra and differential equations?" I would be pretty garbage at that. Whereas, you know, a professor at a uh, uh, university would be good at that. But if I didn't know linear algebra and, and differential equations, um, I'd be, I, I, I wouldn't be horrible at my job, but I would definitely run into a lot of things where I'd be like, wait, what does that mean? Well, well why is it that way? You know, I, I, you know, I would run into too many issues. Actually, no, I, I would be horrible at my job. I, I think I can say that fairly uh, confidently. So the, you, there, can learn that, you can learn linear algebra for two months on your job. No, sure, absolutely, right. So, so you could just say, "Look, well, let's just go online and 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 learn this thing." And and so you know, the, this is the argument that, hey, school is largely credentialing; it's largely a signal, right? It, it's it's not an, an a very expensive easy. one. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and 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 so the, the argument there would be, "Hey, look, just use Coursera and stuff like that." Um, and I think that that's probably a fine idea. It requires some testing. Right, so so we need to empirically test that model and and see whether it works. But you know what I wouldn't do is to just make the change right now and just hope for the best. You know, say look, we basically don't need colleges or whatever. Right, I, I mean, if 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 we move to that model, uh, uh, in one fell swoop, like I can, you know, you can virtually guarantee something that there's going to be bad. Uh, negative externalities to that. Um, uh, well, the model's working pretty good for tech industries, actually. Google, Microsoft, and Facebook have slashed their degree requirements. But let's move on to Coursera, actually. I'm glad you brought it up. It went on IPO recently. Um, yeah. And uh, if I were to give you a million dollars today, uh, how much are you going to put that on Coursera? Well, future? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I would, again, put it on ETS. But but I can talk about <laughs> Coursera itself. But, um, but you know, I, it's not like I've, I've sat around and examined the stock because I'm not a, a fundamental analyst. But, I, you know, C Coursera is just such an amazing uh, uh, tool, right? So, you know, you'll, you'll wonder, you know, how do I do X, Y, Z? Or, I, I, oh, I forgot to take this class in college and I realized it was super important. Well, you know, you go on there, you, 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 you can learn pretty well um, in, you know, for literally a hundredth of the cost that it would, you know, be going to, uh, going to a university, maybe not a hundred, but, you know, at, at, at 20th. Um, so that is, is amazing, obviously. And, and I, I think, um, I'm, I'm sure almost everyone listening here has taken some Coursera course, some, you know, edX course, some online course of some sort, right. And, you know, if you haven't, you know, definitely encourage it. The one thing I would say is this, uh, almost every course is way easier than it would be in real life. And, and you end up learning less if you just follow the prompt. So, so just to give an example, right? So, so, you know, you're doing uh, one of these machine learning courses, whatever. Um, so in, in real life, they wouldn't give you like starter code and, and stuff like that. And just be like, Hey, just put, you put three lines of code here. They just be like, Hey, go do this. You know, it's due next week. Right. And you just need a, you know, you have the data you need to, to get to this outcome. You wouldn't even know if it's right. You're comparing with your friends and stuff like that. Um, that's, uh, you know, you, you, you should actually go out and try to do the hard thing, right. 
So, so edX, or I'm sorry, well, all these things, Coursera, edX, they try to make it easy for the students, right? They, they, they don't want students to get frustrated and leave, but do the frustrating hard thing, right? You just, you know, I, it takes more discipline, but say, look, okay, you know, I, I've done the fill in the line thing. Now, let me just try to build it from scratch. Um, and because that's what, you, you know, in general, you have to do. Yes, you can pull some code from, from here and there. You can pull this repository from, from GitHub. But, but practically, you want to know how to set up the model. Uh, from Let's talk about, um, speaking of hard, um, something that you're very good at, um, Chinese markets. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Chinese stock markets are an enigma for a lot of investors. You know, it yeah. amazes a lot of people. Um, it enrages a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and for the rest, uh, it boggles down. Um, yeah. Um, it has its ups times, for example, um, since uh, late 90s, um, it has grown 2000% um, growth, um, if you compound it, and um, then it has a remarkable 2015 crash. Yeah. Um, and um, part of the reason is that in 2015, government legislations made it easy for um, retail investors to come in and actually do yes. that. The problem that came along with that is that 67% of those investors um, barely have a high school education. Uh, and that is a recipe of disaster. Chinese government pr propaganda on defunct stocks um, on TV actually encouraged a lot of people to buying into that uh, ploy, that kind of uh, compounded the problem. Mm -hmm. It's all over the place. Tell us what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I mean, the, the, the market is... Um... In some ways, it's very uh, crazy, if you will. But in other ways, it's very well structured. And I'll kind of describe the various, you know, what, the various aspects of that. So, on the one hand, you you do have a market that tends to be more volatile than most, and this has been the case more historically than it has been recently. So, the the, the volatility of the market has, um, you know, since inception to or, or, or I'm, I'm sorry, let's say 2000 to 2060, right? So the annualized volatility is about 30%, whereas in the US would be something like 15%, right? So, so that's actually quite a bit uh, of, of uh, annual volatility. Um, so, you know, it, it's a market that tends to have spikes and crashes. It's, you know, the, the market spirits tend to be a little bit stronger there. Um, there are a lot more frequent regulatory changes um, so that's something you have to kind of keep your ears to the ground about. And sometimes those regulatory changes can be counterproductive, right? So, so a particular example of that is, um, they had a, uh, um, you know, a mechanism by which if the market falls, I believe more than, uh, 5% in a day, um, the, the market is closed for the day. Um, now the point there is to protect the market from, uh, uh, losses, but almost immediately after it, it was either five percent or seven percent. After e immediately after uh, it was instituted, the the market fell uh, by uh, that amount, and and it, and it closed, and that happened again. And then they said, "Look, we're we're getting rid of this thing." I mean, the the there's actually a, a rationale for that, right? You you actually don't want these things; they don't to stabilize the market. Um, they, they actually make it them more volatile. So the, these are the sorts of, of things that make the, the market a little bit more disorderly, if you will. There's also a little bit more uh, um, earnings manipulation in, in China, and we can discuss why that is later. But there are other aspects of the market that are much better ordered, right? So um, there is a lot more uh, uh, data releases required uh, for firms. So if you, for example, go from a negative pro profit to a positive profit, you have to release, uh, effectively release your earnings early, similarly from a positive to a negative and, and various other uh, uh, situations, right? So you need to release your earnings a little bit early. You need to ex um, explain what happened. If your uh, market price falls by more than actually a 20% move in, in uh, either direction over the course of 20 days, you need to describe why that happened, maybe quell any rumors um, that, that might exist, sir. Um, there are, so, so the exchanges and the um, 
the, the regulator, the CSRC. So that's basically the Chinese SEC. Um, they uh, will send out uh, letters to firms, and these are public letters, asking about their financials. And they do this a lot, right? So you, you might you know, you might think, well, th this might happen every so often, whatever, right? It, but it, it's it's a very frequent occurrence that they're constantly asking firms like, you know, your your earnings fell quite a bit here. Can you explain why? You're, you know, you said you're going into 5G, that you're now, you know, a 5G business, but I've seen your R&D uh, actually decline. I would expect it to increase markedly if you're going into this new uh, uh, business. So Remember, they're asking, what are the yeah. board members? No, no. So, so this is fascinating. There are regulators. Regulators are asking firms these questions in a very public manner. So, the, so, so you might think, why is this, right? So, so why are Chinese regulators so sort of insistent? Let's say that the not only are things reported accurately, which of course the, the, that's sort of demanded from from other countries as well, but that you know everything is just like very uh, uh, rationally explained. Like, could you provide some clarification here, so on and so forth? Most countries' regulators just say, "Look, the investors will figure that out." You know, uh, you know, buyer beware. Good luck, guys. Um, you know, we, we assume the market's sufficiently uh, efficient. In China, they say, "Look, they're, they're a little bit more paternalistic." They're, they say. We're we're gonna make sure that you know the investors are the least likely to be misled here, and and th they make a a big effort to um, issue all of this information. Now, what's great is for us as you know quant investors or as institutional investors is we actually have the resources to to kind of read and digest all of this information either algorithmically or, or just by picking uh, uh, various bits of information. Um, and that helps us earn excess returns, right? So this is sort of the perfect environment for a quant investor. There's a ton of information uh, being released, uh, but it's not something that a retail investor could practically read. Um, it's not a, something a retail investor could practically d digest. So we can utilize all of that information and use it, to, use it to earn excess returns. And you might say, well, to what extent do the specific releases matter versus the, um, you know, the, the, the standard releases that exist everywhere else, right? So, you know, I, I mentioned this idea of in, information ratio. So if we just live in standard factor world and, and you know, it, it, it doesn't matter what that means exactly. It's just like a simpler world where information ratios are just gonna be lower structurally. So if you use the standard factors that have been discovered in the US, you might earn an information ratio one in China. Um, in, in a backtest. Um, if you use these uh, quant signals built off of China-specific data, you'll earn an information ratio maybe of 1.4. Um, now, you, you know, once you do all the optimizations, you, you can get up to, to three or, or whatever. Um, but th the point here is that um, there's more information trapped in these unique aspects of China about expected return. Um, than there are in the kind of global signals. Um, so that's what makes China such a fascinating market, right? That there's so much information out there. And yet, because the market's 80% retail trading, uh, you can capture that information. They're not reading that, but you can. Is it partially the cause of uh, 2015 crash that, you know, um, algorithmic creator, the con creators like yourself um, are acing it and, you know, people um, barely having an education uh, is probably losing everything that they have? Well, I, okay, well, let's, I, I mean, it, it's not quite that bad, right? Um, you, you know, I, I think uh, is the 2015 crash, I wouldn't describe it as a cause. I would describe it as a symptom of retail trading. Right. And, you know, this sounds, um, what's the word? It, it sounds like almost unsavory, right? That, that we're, because presumably on average, the counterparty is the retail trader, right? It's 80% retail trade. So, so why is this not an unsavory thing to do, right? Because it, it's, it sounds unsavory, right? You're, you're, you're trading against retail investors. Um, we want to bring the market to efficiency. If you bring the market to efficiency, 
the two things happen. One is the right firms get capital. Secondly, if you are a retail investor, you, you just go in there, you just buy the index, then you're golden, right? And, and actually, I would have the same advice for folks within China. You know, if you're a retail investor, why try to, you know, trade up against all these institutions and algorithmic traders and all these other folks just buy the index. And then, you know what? We're all going to be fighting with each other for alpha and there's not going to be very much left, right? When, you know, when institutions have to fight each other for alpha, like there is in, in U.S. large cap, they don't make money, right? So, so on average, you know, I, I mentioned 90% of mutual funds underperform in, in U.S. large cap over 10-year periods. And you might say, well, maybe they're losing money to hedge funds. No, if you look at hedge funds, you know, once you adjust for market risk for uh, interest rate risk, um, they underperform uh, after fees, right? So if you have a bunch of institutions fighting each other for alpha, well, alpha is a zero sum game. So that means that, you know, after fees, they're, they're earning negative, you know, negative excess returns, you know, and, and if the retail investors are just holding the um, index funds, then they're, you know, they're investing in a broadly efficient market because the, the price setters are these um, institutions fighting it out. And they're earning better returns than the institutions, right? Because their fees are lower. Um, so, so that's the way to, to, to beat the institutions, so to speak, right? That, that you know, the, if, if all the retail investors are, are buying um, uh, index funds, like e even in, in China, if that could happen, if, that, if we could manifest that world, then we'd all just be duking it out with each other, uh, uh, trying to scrape whatever little alpha is left uh, in the market. Um, and, and that's the dream in some way, weirdly enough, right? You want to get to a place where the retail investor is doing well. And, and the way to do that is by making the market efficient. Well, really interesting um, idea that's primarily based on um, Chinese stocks. And I was just wondering, uh, do you really have a margin that big? I mean, for example, if I am someone from US, Australia, New Zealand, or any mm -hmm. English speaking country, the efficient stock markets, why would I be interested in investing um, a Chinese ETF, especially what I hear all the crash stories and uh, yeah. inefficient policies and regulators coming as if it's your own shop? Right. right well, so. I, I don't, I, and I, you know, th this is for compliance reasons. I, I don't want to talk about this in context of the ETF in particular, but I, I'll, I'm talking about it in, in kind of abstract uh, uh, terms here. Um, so why might one want to invest in China Asia's, right? So if you hold EM, you probably already hold a good amount of China in um, Hong Kong and in the US, right? Through China ADRs, right? So um, Alibaba, JD.com, um, uh, these sorts of firms are, are listed as uh, ADRs, NEO, right? Um, within, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm right, listed as ADRs in the, in the US. Uh, within um, Hong Kong, um, you'll, you'll have f firms like Tencent um, and also a bunch of large banks um, uh, listed there, right? And, and so, you, you know, one probably already has exposure there. Those markets, interestingly, are largely uh, efficient, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're not, certainly not as inefficient as the onshore market. And that's China A shares, Shanghai and Shenzhen. Um, so, you know, why would you want to go into this inefficient market? Well, there are a couple of reasons. On the beta side, it's actually much more diversified within China A shares that is onshore China, than it is in Hong Kong and um, the US. So if one believed that, you know, tech was the way, I, I just want to buy tech stocks and, you know, that's the thing that's going to work. And, and I guess some, you know, financial stocks in, in Hong Kong and, and that's all I need. Um, then yeah, the, you know, ADRs and, um, uh, you know, the Hong Kong stocks will sort of fit the bill. Um, but if you want like a broad-based exposure to the Chinese economy, uh, that would be China A shares, Shanghai, Shenzhen. Uh, but more, you know, our argument would also be, look, it's not just about the beta. Or I'm, I'm sorry, I want to mention one, one other thing. 
uh, the correlation between China A shares and the rest of the global market is extremely low. And, and in fact, um, the, this one is, is pretty incredible. So, so I, I think it's, it's worth uh, mentioning. China onshore's correlation with China offshore is roughly the same level as emerging markets correlation is with the US stock market, right? So what does that mean conceptually? It means that you know if you're invested in China offshore and you say, look, I'm diversified, right? I, you know, I, I've got, or, you know, I, I've got my China exposure. You know, that would be from a return correlation perspective, the rough equivalent of owning the S&P 500 and saying, look, I, I've got my EM exposure, right? It's okay. I'm, I'm in the US. That's, you know, roughly the same thing. Like the, the, the China onshore um, market, it, it just behaves very differently. Um, and, and that return correlation, that, that low return correlation provides incredible diversification. So it's such a great diversifier uh, in the portfolio. Um, so that's definitely something to consider on the beta side. Now, the alpha side, right? So, you know, can you earn excess returns? Do you just want to buy an index or do you want to do something more active, right? So what's the argument for, well, I mean, well, let me first give the argument for doing something, just doing the index, right? Well, I, I don't know when the alpha is going to dry up. Maybe the alpha is already gone. I'll just buy the, the index. That'll, that'll work eventually, right? I'll, I'll, get, I'll get the beta exposure, right? Um, but, you know, what's, what's the alpha case? Well, there are a couple of things, right? I mentioned that 90% of uh, funds in the U.S. and U.S. large cap uh, underperform over, a ten, over any 10-year period. In, in China, um, I actually, I, I don't know what the percent is, but I know that um, they have outperformed on average despite having a 1.5% average annual fee, right? So that's pretty gnarly, right? So that means that they're outperforming by at least 1.5% on average, right? Um, then, uh, so, so that's mutual funds, but, but maybe, you know, China mutual funds, they just, they're just really good at investing in the China market, right? They're, they're sitting there, they, they know what's up. What about foreign investors? How, how are they doing? So you can look at uh, qualified foreign institutional investors. You can look at Northbound Connect investors investing through uh, Hong Kong. So, so you can do that globally, but you, you just need to execute your, your tr trades using a Hong Kong Connect account. Um, those investors um, outperform. And actually, the Northbound Connect investors outperform markedly, right? So their information ratio is 1.97, at least historically, cross-sectionally. Um, then, um, you know, you might say, well, okay, international investors, but does that mean quant investing works? And I've already discussed, you know, the, the standard quant factors earn an information ratio of one, you know, China specific quant factors earn 1.41, you know, combine everything together, optimize information ratio close to three in, in, uh, uh, China large cap, uh, four in small cap. Um, so the alpha is. And again, backtested, right? I, I need to keep keep mentioning that, right? Those, those are backtested information ratios. Um, so, you know, with alpha like that, you know, it's probably probably worth uh, investigating doing something active. Um, so that's why China is interesting, right? And and why it's a, a compelling market. That yeah, it's a little bit more volatile. But it's a great diversifier. You might even be able to lower your portfolio volatility by increasing your China A exposure. And you can um, earn excess returns through active investing, something you can't do in many other markets. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, of course, volatility is probably one of the prereqs for um, higher um, alphas also. Um, but let's zoom out and uh, talk more uh, from a fundamental analysis point of view and not the technical analysis, which is the... Sure. Um, trade relations between U.S. and China, because that certainly is going to boil over to stock markets um, yeah. and uh, future predictions. Um, Alaska Summit um, actually recently um, established the fact that um, Biden is going to hold uh, Trump's uh, trade tariffs, and which is certainly going to um, evoke retaliation. And we're also in the middle of semiconductor and microchip uh, fights. Uh, there have recently been yep. um, talks about... Uh, 
the um, shutdown attempts of takeovers and a uh, certain percentage of ownership um, in European yep. and US companies from China and vice versa. Uh, yep. And that is probably very dangerous for the kind of collaboration uh, that we're expecting, especially in time of COVID-19. How do you see sure. that play out, uh, especially for your um, EDF and its long-term um, horizon and in general, the market? Well, you know, I, I think for... I, I sorry, I, I really can't talk about the ETF. I, I know that that's annoying, but I, it's just some uh, regulatory thing, right? But I can talk no, about but you can do it generally strategy. how it's actually going to play. Yeah, out. yeah, absolutely, sure, sure. Um, so I I wish I knew, but I I think there are, the incentive for someone like me is to be very sanguine, right? And and I'll kind of explain that and then talk about why I I think you know being a little bit uh, more on the fence may m- make more sense, right? So, so why might it make sense for me to say, "Oh, look, you know, we're, you know, we're fully economically integrated. Everything's going to work fine, right? The, uh, both sides have an economic incentive, you know, to rattle their sabers and then go back to business as usual, right? So, uh, that's the sort of line that someone like you would expect someone like me to take, right? Um, there's another side to things in this case, which is there's geopolitical tensions as well, right? This isn't purely uh, economic, right? The the reasons why, um, you know, countries don't want, um, you know, Chinese firms sort of building their 5G networks and so on and so forth. That's not about technology. That's not about economics. That's about geopolitical tensions, right? Um, So, that's a thing that's more worrisome for me, right? Because from an economic standpoint, it is indeed the case that, you know, if we're trying to maximize GDP, you know, we, we want to get things back to business as usual as soon as possible. Um, if there were, you know, if geopolitical tensions weren't, uh, are a thing, right? Then 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 suddenly you're you're worried about, you know, the, the values of, you, you know, wh- hey, wh- what's, what are going to happen to my allies, right? So I've got allies out there. What about them? Um, you know, are, are we, you know, are, are we going to be giving away military technology or, or, well, technology that can be used in, in military applications, so on and so forth. So, so that suddenly becomes a worry. And that's why I think uh, this is, you know, we can't just be, uh, blindly optimistic here, right? I, I just, you know, I, uh, of course we all want things to work out, but we can't kind of live in a fantasy world where they, oh, everything's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. You know, just, uh, uh dive in head first and, and hope for the best. Um, we, we can't live in that fantasy world, you know, and, um, you know, that, that's all I can reasonably say about it, I guess. Yeah, fair enough. And I think there, yeah. there's a lot um, of um, uh, emotional baggage that comes into play also, um, it, in, despite uh, stock markets being uh, pure number of games. But let's talk a little bit about, you know, what stock markets, regardless of where they are doing um, to regulate themselves. Um, US stock market is notorious uh, for scams. Uh, <laughs> We have recently in Archegos uh, go down uh, right. along with that. Well, yeah, the, 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 that's not a scam. It's a, it's a, no, no, it's I'm, a, I'm not right, finished. Right. Okay, okay, go ahead. <laughs> so we're talking okay. about uh, Theranos, um, uh, Elizabeth Holmes, you know, probably one of the largest, um, you yeah. know, um, uh, um, scams um, after Enron. Um, you know, woman was on Forbes cover, you know, rode on the bandwagon of yeah. feminism and, you know, technology that didn't even exist. Um, and then we also have in recent times, Wirecard um, shut down um, um, yeah. in Germany. Um, CEO is um, actually missing an action. Um, CEO is in jail. Yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is that what's inherently wrong uh, with stock markets? Are, are they so easy to fool? Uh, is it public sen- sentiment? Is it their inherent um, lack of um, self-regulation. Why mm. is that that it's it's become a magnet for um, such scammers? Well, I you know I I, I want to t- because I, I think there are a mix of things in there, right? So um, Theranos was a was a private firm, right? So so they, they maybe scammed private equity investors, but so listed uh, they, on I, stock exchange, right? 
Oh, it, it, is it? I mean, it, it might be, but but I I, I don't think they went public. Billion. Well, I, I mean, you can have a a very high valuation, but but not be publicly listed. Um, so I I don't believe they were, but but I might be wrong about that. Um, but uh, you, you know, Archegos was um, I'll, I I can I can talk about th- things in turn, right? So um, you know, Ar- Archegos was a case. It, it, it wasn't a scam. The guy lost his own money and quite a lot, right? He, uh, you know, took giant leverage positions. And, you know, normally this works out okay because the banks or the, the, the brokers hold uh, sufficient collateral, right, to such that they can liquidate the, uh, the, the portfolio if it goes down too much. Uh, but they allowed a little bit more leverage than they should have in this case, right? And um, what ended up happening was uh, they, you know, he basically lost everything and and then some, so to speak. And when they sold the, well, when Credit Suisse and Nomura, uh, you know, liquidated their holdings, the, uh, the, the, they actually took ended up taking losses on their own books, right? It, it ended up being the case that Goldman and Morgan Stanley seemed to sell uh, uh, before, right? So, so the, they, they sold out a little bit quicker. And so they managed to avoid as big of a, of a fall. So, so th- you know, th- that's not a scam per se. Uh, maybe he kind of scammed the, the brokers there. So, you know, uh, he, he kind of convinced them that, hey, you know, it'll, it'll all be okay. But I, I wouldn't call that a scam, right? Yeah, I mean, by it, definition, those, we could apply right? these distinctions for Enron also and easily said that. No, no, no. That, that's, you can't, that's a scam. That's a scam. What's right? the I difference? Mean, because they lied, right? I, I mean, well, so, so did so everyone they, else. Tyrannos was a huge lie. There was no technology. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I, absolutely. But, but that's a, you know, I'm pretty sure it was a private company. But, but again, we can, look, we can look that up later. It's fine. But um, the, uh, you know, in, in the case of um, uh, Enron, right? So, so what's happening in Enron versus, you know, this guy who took too much leverage. So let's say I am really confident and I just take a ton of leverage and I wipe myself out and then some. Right. So then my, my broker has to eat the, uh, the losses there. Now I didn't scam my broker. I'm just stupid. Right. And, and confident I'm, I'm confidently stupid. Right. And, and so th- that's sort of what happened uh, uh, there. Now in, in the case of um, Enron, right. They, they sort of made up all, all these trans the, these sort of self-dealing transactions and boosted their revenue tremendously and uh, kind of stuck that on off balance sheet items. Um, so, you know, th- th- the question is, how often does that happen? The answer is not often, right? I mean, I, I don't think it happens particularly often. Uh, otherwise, on average, um, stock market return, I mean, if, if it definitely happened on average, stock market returns would be something like on average negative, right? Because prices would be uh, so inefficient, um, you know, there, there would be, uh, uh, you know, firms going bust left, right, and center. Um, but on average, it's, you know, th- these are tail events, right? You hear about them because they're interesting, right? It's not like we have an Enron every day or something like that. That, that would be... Uh, I mean, it's not only Enron, it's about a Nissan, uh, you know, um, its CEO is probably missing an action, you know, taking refuge in Lebanon. Uh, then we talk about um, a lot of other companies who are doing other things. And a part of... A, debate has become um, pointed towards not the companies and the CEOs itself, but towards big four. How can you sign off, um, you know, audits of those reports, which is widely incomprehensible for even a basic undergraduate who understands double bookkeeping? Uh, do you think that a little bit of blame also goes to big four uh, and they're part of, or, or let's say complacent into um, these betting? Um, are they complicit? I doubt it. There's too much to risk, especially after what happened to Arthur Anderson, right? So Arthur Anderson was completely shut down. I think, uh, and, and, you know, some, some part of Arthur Anderson was indeed complicit, though the entire firm wasn't right. So, so some part of Arthur Anderson was complicit with, uh, um, Enron, not everyone, obviously, right. It's a big firm or it was a big firm. Now it's, it doesn't exist. Um, but that, um, you know, I, I, I think we're, we're, you're looking at things a little bit on what I would describe on the margins and 
or not on the margins. You're, you know, th these things on one tail of the distribution do not describe the whole, right? And it, it, they, they, you see, you know, we can see things on one side of the distribution and on both sides of the di distribution, I should say. And they seem much more salient because they're so much more interesting. But what is less interesting is a company with boring bookkeeping that, and the, the you know, the, uh, uh, the auditor's like, yeah, it's, it's correct. And then that's, that's it, right? Um, so if you were to search for earnings manipulation in the US, it's not like it doesn't exist, but it, it's much harder to find, right? And, and the, the, there are actually ways to kind of detect uh, uh, Actually, it doesn't even have to be U.S. For example, in case of Wirecard, what they did was, you know, their mm -hmm. earnings um, in U.S., you know, it was reported just fine. What was what ended up happening is that their operations in Philippines and Dubai and, you know, um, other countries, mm -hmm. you know, off the grid, they were overblown. And certainly, of course, someone signed them off to be right. And, you know, they were sure. scraped into the books. And in the end, because it was such a huge scam that, you know, people weren't even expecting, you know, all the services connected with those um, suffered a huge yeah. attack. So it, there certainly are loopholes. And the problem is that, you know, if big four is not doing dis due diligence, why do they exist? Well, I look, I, I don't think they're, I, I think they're doing due diligence, right? They're, they are on average, uh, you know, doing okay, seemingly, right? If, if on average they were not doing well, we would see uh, much worse outcomes than we are now, right? The, 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 so, so let me give an extreme example. Um, let's say uh, you know you're you start a police force, right? And 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 you 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 say, hey guys, you know it's your job to police this city. And then you know someone dies, right? And someone gets murdered, and and you say, look, uh, you know what were you guys doing? You, you know you're, you're you're the police force. Some somebody somebody was murdered. You know that shouldn't have happened. And you know the, the response would be, look, I, I mean, we can't prevent literally every single murder, right? Without doing extreme things that that actually make life unpalatable. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, the, the, there are there are better statistical tools to kind of analyze this and decide whether you know we are on average skilled at our jobs. Um, and in a similar way, you, you know, I, I think it, it's I, I don't know what the the kind of controlled experiment is where we eliminate the big four and then put them back in, right? Uh, but, you know, it, just looking at the behavior of, of the markets and, and, you know, reading financial reports and so on and so forth, I don't get the sense that on average, the big four are dropping the ball. And I have no, I, I don't care about the big four. I've, I have no uh, um, dog in that fight. Um, but, you know, to, to say that they're, I, I, I never heard that, that idea that they are on average dropping the ball. And I just, I don't think it's, it's, I, I wouldn't agree with that assessment. I don't have evidence of that assessment. I think, you know, a, a few um, firms manipulating earnings and having um, uh, auditors fail to catch it. Uh, that's expected. Right. I mean, Fair enough. I mean, someone's got to yeah. do the job that four, Big Four is doing. So, you know, if not them, you know, someone else is going to do that. Sure. And then they're going to uh, drop the ball at some point also. But let's move on to something some thing that um, is very uh, inspiring that you work with one of the best minds um, in the industry. Let's talk to Jason. Um, how's it like to talk, work with such a brilliant mind? You know, he has managed uh, wonderful portfolios um, and um, his work speaks for itself. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, he. I've worked with him for 15 years. I've definitely learned a lot uh, uh, from him. Um, and, you know, I, I think every, if you want to get good at something, it's a pretty good idea to attach yourself to someone who's also good, right? I, or, or, you know, who, who's done it, right? And and so I, I'm lucky enough to to have been able to kind of work with him and uh, gain his insights, right? And he, he, he doesn't just have insights about research and portfolio management, which of course he does, but about the industry as a whole, right? He, he's been in the industry and he, he has, you know, what I describe as sort of clever insights about, you know, how, how the market works, right? The, the importance of analytics and stuff like that. So, you know, um, 
one thing that he taught me was, look, you can have the best product in the world. If you can't decompose the performance well, um, it's at, at least on the quant side, obviously on the fundamental side, it's a little bit harder to do that. But if, if you can't decompose the performance uh, well, um, it's just not going to sell well, right? People, people are going to look at it and be like, well, why is it working? Is it going to suddenly reverse? If you can if you can explain why it works and, and do it in a way that's both intuitive and complete, right? Um, that is the, the optimal thing, right? That's sort of the holy grail. And, and so that's why we've spent so much effort on, um, you know, good analytics. And actually, I would even say, God, I'm, I'm trying to think, I, I probably spent like something like 20% of my time on, is that true? Probably about 15%, let's say, um, on, on building solid analytics and being able to explain portfolio performance. Um, I, I, w- one of those things that I, I wouldn't have expected, I would have just thought, look, you just want to, you just want to make higher returns. Right. But if, if, if you can't explain it, it, it just makes people suspicious. Um, so that, you know, just insights like that, you know, it, it's, it's very, uh, uh, you know, you, you learn a lot of things like that. And, and so, you know, in, in general, you know, whatever field you're working, if, if you want to get good, uh, you know, fi- you know, be the apprentice to the master and then become the master yourself eventually. More than, um, you know, people realize uh, the impact of neural network and black box um, algorithms mm. is huge when it comes to um, stock investing. And I'm sure that you have this problem right in front of you, especially when in co- you put in context of decomposing what's happening inside and then explaining it to investors. Sure. There's no way out of it. Um, how do you tackle that problem? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So we, uh, on the monthly horizon, we don't use neural networks. We're, we're actually, I don't want to talk about that. Never mind. But, but you know, on, on a monthly horizon, we, we don't uh, 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 use neural networks. But, you know, we, there's still the issue of, look, you've got a gradient boosting model, a linear ridge model, a, a random forest model. You're using an ensemble of these three things. You're trying to predict returns. Is there some, you know, way you can de- decompose the performance? Uh, well, uh, so I, I, you know, I, I feel like th- there's nothing proprietary here. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to talk about it. What we do is we build the expected returns of each signal in turn. So we group the signals together. So we have a set of signals we call value, a set of signals we call profitability, a set of signals we call productivity, a set of signals we call low default risk, so on and so forth. Um, we, we group these signals together and we build expected returns using... Uh, one, and then l- let's say value, and then value and profitability, then value, profitability, and accounting conservatism, so on and so forth, right, on, on down the line. And then what we do is we build the portfolios using the, our optimization software. Um, and, uh, you know, build the incremental portfolios. Incremental portfolios is what we call it, right? So we have our value incremental portfolio, our, um, you know, profitability uh, incremental portfolio, that would be profitability minus value, right? The, you, you'd subtract the portfolio weights and you get the, the incremental changes in the weights. And that allows you to decompose where the performance comes from. Um, and you, so, so the ordering actually matters. You, you need to do some things to, to sort of mitigate the effect of, ordering. But that ends up doing a complete job of explaining the returns. And it does it in a fairly intuitive way. So if one of the kind of standard factors does well, let's say gross profitability does well, or, or profitability does well, I should say, then you, w- you would expect the profitability component to do well. And in general, we find that to be the case. Um, however, of course, it's also capturing all the nonlinear information uh, as well. Otherwise, you wouldn't even do a nonlinear model, right? If, if, if you were just, you know, if you could do a pure linear decomposition, that would mean that you, you actually had a linear model. Um, so th- that's how we break things out. And we can actually attribute our, our weights to each of these things. And we can attribute the performance to each of those things. So, so we could say, look, this month we did well because of gross profitability, because of, uh, uh, you know, accounting conservatism. We faced a headwind because of, you know, our productivity signals, so on and so forth. Um, so, so that's the the uh, 
idea there. I totally get it. I mean, in, if you're using machine learning model, then probably it's more heuristics, um, hierarchical based decision making process, which are fairly um, easy to explain, or let's say, you know, for a computer. But you know, if you're using a neural network, and you said that you know you're not using it on a monthly um, horizon, let's say, um, it also is probably more useful if you feed it the um, historical data, and in that case, the problem of explainability would arise. Um, in explaining on the log longer horizon what is going on. Uh, for example, um, if you're using machine learning models that probably would capture really good essence of uh, linear um, relationships. But then um, they're always not, we talked about seasonality before, and that is something that's not a perfect linear relationship. And for that, you probably knew you would you, use neural network. And then it's going to become a problem. I mean, for, you understand the concept or phenomenon what's happening, but then to be able to explain it to um, investors um, or let's say uh, the board, um, how did it work out? Well, I, I, you know, I, I think with this decomposition methodology, you're, you're capturing both the linear and the nonlinear aspects in each incremental step. So you can point to any given stock, even historically, by the way, you can point to any given stock and say, look, look, we were overweight this stock because of, you know, return on equity and return on net op operating assets. We were underweighted because of this esoteric, you know, technical signal um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so that, you know, we have that level of decomposition and that helps us tell that story. Um, and, it, you know, in general, I think it's been successful, right? Because in general, uh, you, you have two sorts of folks, right? The, the folks who have very simple models um, and, you know, they can be linearly explained and it's very straightforward, but, you know, that just doesn't capture as much information. And then you have the folks who are capturing a lot of information, um, but just can't explain. And, you, you know, you, you want to actually have the, the strengths of both where you're capturing all that information, you're able to explain it. And, you know, I, I feel like in the conversations we've had, people have been, uh, people have understood, right? I, you know, the, there haven't been questions of like, well, you know, how does the gradient boosting tree look exactly? Like nobody cares about that in particular, right? They're, they're, they're looking at, you know, can you attribute that stock's weight? Can you uh, attribute the portfolio's return? Um, and can you do so completely? And, you know, th this method checks all of those boxes. I think it's above the pay grade of a lot of retail investors, you know, probably looking for um, returns and not, um, you know, algorithmic explainability. Um, sure. Let's talk about what's your favorite um, book um, when it comes to investing. Um, I certainly like a lot um, this um, Tendo Investor by Manish Babarai who talks about yeah. uh, Gujarati um, Indian investment in motels and you know yeah. big bets, uh, infrequent bets, um, and yeah. safe bets. Uh, and then was certainly um, Warren Buffett's favorite, um, Intelligent Investor by Graham. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I've I've definitely read uh, the latter. And but but you know once you're in the field, you read less books and read more papers, right? And I think that's true of any field, right? Um, and so I, I've been, um, you know, that's been my, my game um, uh, most, right? Now, the, the one paper that had sort of the biggest influence, I suppose, um, was uh, the, uh, geez, now, now I don't even remember. I, I just know that the authors are Gu Kelly and, and uh, Shio, right? And, and they, they, they wrote a paper on uh, machine learning, uh, applications in predicting returns. And uh, that struck a chord with me, um, obviously, right? <laughs> so so that ended up being an, an, an influential one. Now, the underlying explanations, interestingly, I really disagree with, and that's probably a topic for another time. But, but um, you, you know, they, they take a very efficient market view of things. And it just, I don't know how they square their results with that. Like, it, it's some you know, I, I would describe it as some impressive sort of mental backflips, so to speak. Now, I mean, obviously, I, I, I mean, I, I'm happy to, to talk to them about, about what their what their thoughts are. Obviously, they wouldn't describe it that way. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I had um, uh, trouble kind of 
uh, understanding where they were coming from there. Uh, but you know, the, the the kind of methodological insights there were were extremely strong. Now, as far as um, books that are just interesting, you know, the, the book on I, I don't even remember the, the the name of the the book, but it's a book on on Jim Simons and the Medallion Fund came out relatively recently. Um, that was um, and and you know you can use Google you know book on Jim Simons and Medallion Fund and, and you'll you'll find it pretty quick. Um, that was an absolutely fascinating read, and you know one thing that is. One thing that I, I found so great, and b- by the way, the, the Medallion Fund is a fund that's earned like, uh, I think about 30% excess returns for uh, 30 odd years, right? Um, so not excess returns, 30% returns, right? So that's insane, right? I, I, I think that, uh, you know, you, you don't need to be in the in the uh, uh, finance industry to, to realize just how preposterous of a um, uh, return history that is. Um, but, but the question, you know, it, it talks about like how it happened, so to speak. It's not like giving away algorithms, but it's talking about his mindset and so on and so forth. And, you know, he was a guy who just, you know, he, he, he heard the folks saying, hey, look, markets are mostly efficient, so on and so forth. And he said, uh, I don't think that's true. You know, I, I just, it just doesn't seem to square with reality uh, in, you know, with what I'm seeing, Right. And, and the question is, you know, where do I find those inefficiencies? And he tried various things and some of them worked, some of them didn't, but he just kept iterating and kept pushing towards automation. And it wasn't just him, obviously he had a, a team of folks and I, I forget who it was who said, look, we just need to go to automated algorithmic. That's what we're doing, you know? Um, I, I, I forget who, who that guy was, but there, were, there was that guy, right? And, um, they built this incredible algorithm and obviously have kept improving it over the years. Um, but it just showed the, and it's a right tailed, you know, not everyone can do this, right? These are the, some of the smartest people on the planet. Um, but, you know, the tenacity combined with a ton of intelligence can, can do a lot, right? And, and you know, I, I think we also know from long-term capital management, uh, you know, it doesn't just take having a lot of degrees and, and famous names, right? Um, but, but, you know, I, I definitely recommend reading probably both of those books, right? So, so the, the book on long-term capital management, the book on uh, Jim Simons, because it, it shows kind of both sides of that. Well, one being, you know, really smart people blowing themselves up, that's long-term capital management. And the other uh, really smart people executing exceptionally well consistently for 30 years straight um and kind of seeing the dichotomy there you know the necessary humility and willingness to improve and maybe some luck too right i mean it's it's hard to uh to pry it apart you know maybe is there a universe where the medallion fund blows up i don't know but um you know we we, we can't push that out of the, the realm of possibility. Um, stock markets are probably one of the most uh, tense industries you can think of. Um, it's not uncommon of uh, people to work 100 hours a week um, in Goldman Sachs. Um, one of those um, mm-hmm. um, unfortunate fellow actually committed suicide and that's been reported. Yes. Um, and nothing has changed um, ever since as well. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, what do you do to unplug um, out of that? Um, yeah, craze. Yeah, right, right. And 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 for for, for anyone thinking of applying here, uh, we don't work hundred hour weeks, so don't worry about that. But but I, you know, it it, it really does depend on on where you work, right? So um, if you're a quant, it it doesn't make sense to work hundred hour weeks for a very uh, uh, specific reason. You're doing extremely intellectually strenuous things. Your, your brain simply won't function after a point, right? So I, I don't know what the uh, new neurochemistry of that is, but just, you know, try it, right? So, so try just solving, like, you know, I, it's, we, we don't sit around and solve, solve different, you know, uh, uh, you know diff- difficult equations or stuff like that. Um, but, you know, just 
find something very difficult and just do it and then see when you give up, right? It's not going to be 12 hours, right? You, th 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 there's going to be a point at which your productivity starts suffering uh, tremendously. Um, so, so luckily we don't have to work those hours, but you know, we'll, to, to unwind, I, I do a couple of things, right? One is I play with my dogs. Um, and the second is I, you know, I, I lift weights. And what's interesting is I've, I've lifted weights for a long time, but I haven't started bulking until very recently. And it's because I misunderstood how important diet was, right? So, you know, I, I'd spent, um, you know, I, I, I spent so long just like going in there, lifting some amount of weight, right? So I, I think my bench was stuck at like 135 or something. And I was like, and I'm, I'm a pretty light guy, right? So I'm like one, uh, 140, right? And I was like, why am I stuck at this weight? Like, I just, I can't get through it. You know, I try like lowering the weight, doing more reps, Increase it, you know, do, doing one rep of something higher, right? But but why can't I get to like a, a steady state where I'm lifting more? And I I just started like reading online and stuff, and you know, it, it turns out there there are three kind of important things. One is that um, you should evenly space protein intake. The second thing is that um, you want to eat protein kind of right after your workout, like within thirty minutes. That tends to help as well. And then the the, the third thing is that it's not clear that there's an upper bound on protein uh, absorption uh, for muscle growth, right? I mean, obviously there is one, there has to be, right? You, you, you can't just keep shoveling uh, protein in, you know, arbitrarily, a, right? A lot of but, contradictory evidence, for example, yeah. uh, a lot of people mm -hmm. think that there's a four hour window for protein ingestion. Um, and that people think, you know, a lot of protein will actually, you know, um, intercede with your uh, liver function, um, you know, it might actually end up damaging it. it. Well, well uh, I, I've heard it for kidneys, but if and only if you have um, kidney problems, right? So if, if you have kidney, I, I, some, I, I don't know, some form of kidney disease. I, I, I'm not a doctor. I have no idea what I'm talking about. But, but I, I, I do know that um, there are some folks who are cannot ingest large amounts of protein because it will affect i think their kidneys right do you also have um, like a specific diet a keto or uh... no nothing like that but but i do have um you know I, I i just try to get more uh you know significantly more protein than than i did before right so so i'm vegetarian right so it makes it extra difficult but you know i've i've started getting into a lot more fake meat right so impossible burger stuff like that um, and then also, you know, protein shakes, all that other jazz. Um, and, you know, I, I've actually, you know, I, I said I was like capped out at 135. Like I'm at 175 now. My weight, my body weight hasn't changed that much. I actually gained a ton of weight when I was bulking. I cut back down. Um, but, you know, the, the fact that it took a year and a half to do what it took, you, you know, I, I was capped out for like years effectively. And it took like a year and a half to like get up. To, to that, it, it tells, it says something. I know it's, I know it's an anecdote, right? But, but it does suggest that, look, uh, the, the protein intake does, it, it matters at least a little bit. Now, now I, I mean, definitely look at the empirical research, right? Don't look at one person's story, right? The, the empirical evidence is, is where, where you go for this stuff. And there's a lot more now than, I, I remember looking like 15 years ago or something, and I was like, God, it's just, there, there's not enough here to like draw any conclusions. And so I just went to a personal trainer. He was like, ah, don't worry too much about diet. Just focus on lifting. Um, and I just, I just took that as, as gospel for way too long, apparently. Um, I think it's kind of a culture in the gym. You know, you take advice from the biggest guy out there. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, you know, it just never works out that you keep <laughs> running at him for months and yep. uh, it just never works. And, and I can kind of intuitive also, there are also, uh, certainly meta studies um, on protein intake and its relative benefits. For example, that is the building block uh, for your muscles. So yeah. more of it, of course, is going to work out. But I think the problem these days is the opposite. Uh, um, you know, shedding weight that you don't want <laughs> yeah, is probably yeah. the bigger one. Well, right. I, I, you know, I, I think mo more folks have that issue obviously but 
it, it it actually makes it rough and so I'm, I'm not I'm, geez, I, I'm, it makes it sound like I'm whining but uh, but I'm, I don't mean it to sound like that um, so uh, you know folks that are small but have trouble gaining weight right so so you know why does that happen right it's, it's because you, you're well when you eat more you're just like moving around more like I, I can't sit still like even sitting still right now is like very difficult for me I want to like get up and move around um, but uh, and I, I think you've noticed me shifting around in my chair constantly. That, that's something I, I just can't get rid of. I have to keep moving, right? Um, and m- there are many people like this, right? Who just they, they just need to keep moving. They, it, it burns calories. It's hard to, to gain weight, hard to bulk. Um, and there, there are less resources out for those folks, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's not necessarily a less understood phenomenon. I mean, at the end of the day, it's calories in, calories out when it comes to weight gain um, or weight loss. But you know, the, the sort of psychological aspects of it, you know, w- when you talk about uh, losing weight, right, there, there are all these things about like, oh, keep this food out of the, you know, vision, right, don't even buy it, don't even let it be, you know, on your countertop, uh, you know, uh, all, all these sorts of um, methods, but but they, they don't have the same thing for weight gaining. I mean, I guess you could do the same thing, but if you're not tempted by a cake, right, then what is putting the cake out on the counter going to do for you? You know what I mean? Like that's not going to help you gain, gain weight if, if you're not interested in eating it. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I wish there were more um, sort of resources out there for like, look, these are the kind of psychological tricks you use to get enough calories. Um, and I'm sure I could, I, you know, maybe I need to be searching better. The, the you, internet's a big place. Do you, do you have like apps? Um, what was that? Calorie counter or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, but yeah, like my fitness pal stuff like my that. Fitness pal, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I use it, but it, it helps on cutting. But weirdly, when you're bulking, it's actually, it, it makes eating annoying because you have to go in there and you have to be like, okay, now I need to put in this calorie am- amount, right? So it, it weirdly inhibits the amount of food you want to eat because you're, you're, you're adding a cost to it. Um, so, and you know, when, when I'm cutting, yeah, for sure. Right. Um, but when I'm bulking, um, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I think it's, and uh, how's it going on the cardio front? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I run, um, and you know, I, I do a mix of like running a couple miles and then I'll, I'll s- sprint right for some period of time. Um, and, and that seems to do okay. And, and the reason why cardio is important, and I, I think everyone knows this idea already, but I, you know, I, it's probably worth uh, um, mentioning, right? That uh, cognition is affected by one's ability to do cardio, right? So if you're doing aerobic exercise and um, I think, God, now, now I don't know, does it specifically need to be cardio or is this like running a long time good as well? I, I'm not 100% sure, but... Um, that will improve your cognition. And I believe the mechanism is um, the buildup of glycogen, right? So instead of storing uh, energy as fat, or I guess directly as sugar, right? Uh, ready to be used. Um, there are, it increases your glycogen stores. Um, and then that increases one's ability to kind of draw resources to thinking or other activities as well. I mean, also there's you know, running, increased blood oxygen as well. Um, yeah, that that sounds intuitive to me. I, I so I honestly, I'm I'm really not the person to talk to about this stuff. I, I just don't. I, I'm speaking off of it's fine. stuff I've read loud. In, in pop science, right, right. So, but but you know, just as a disclaimer, like if if there's a doctor out here with you know face palming at what I'm talking about, you know, I, I get it, right. I'm I'm reading this stuff and like, yeah, you know, I I might read some of it in a medical journal, but in general, I'm getting it from like you know, a pop science thing, like scientific American or something. Mm. Um, so yeah, you, you know, you just, uh, probably do your own research, talk to an actual doctor, talk to an actual uh, yeah. person in the field. So whatever you hear from now on, uh, just take it with a grain of salt. Um, yeah, um, Vivek, it was fantastic talking to you. So much information, um, that's out there and it's very rare that we get to talk to someone who's an actual expert in market, especially like China. Um, you know, people are downplaying the importance of um, how big it can be. Um, and it's, it's certainly good to know a lot about this. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. Minaj, it was a, a pleasure. I, I appreciate it.
Um, everyone else, the show is going to be on Spotify, um, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Feel free to join our Slack community where we have discussions around the topic and stay tuned for the next week's guest. Thank you so much again.